Hello, welcome back to the Group Agent 5 tutorial series. Today is the first part of a two-part series in which we're going to be talking about mixing. The reason I've split it into two is, well, firstly, it's a big subject, but the general concepts um, are most closely applicable to the beat agent, and we can analyze that in isolation. The acoustic and percussion agents have a few quirky rules that kind of neatly compartmentalize, so we'll deal with them in a separate video. Today we're talking about, well, firstly, what features does Groove Agent have for mixing? And the answer is pretty damn rich. You can mix your entire kit completely inside the agent and throw out a vanilla stereo feed to Cubase. In fact, that's how it comes out of the box. If I turn a pattern on, everything we are hearing, all these different drum instruments that are being played, it's all resolving down to a single stereo output. And here we have the Groove Agent track receiving all of that data. But of course, Groove Agent itself has its own very rich mixing capabilities. And at some point we have to make a decision as to where the division of those responsibilities lie. And that's hopefully what I'm gonna do with these videos where we'll try to figure out where that, where that division lies. First, I thought we should have a look at the internal mixing options in Groove Agent, because as I say, that's how it comes out of the box. All of the stuff is dealt with internally and it throws a stereo feed out. How, how is that accomplished? Every one of the uh, drum instrument pads, we've got 128 instrument pads, and every one of those is capable of being routed to one of 16 mixer buses inside Groove Agent. We can figure out where they're currently routed by clicking the little info button, show pad info. And now we see their output destinations. This uh, C1 says out kick, and then we've got a couple of snares, three snares, got some toms up here, hi-hats, some crashes and some rides. Various different types of sound are being output to various different types of buses. Let's find out where those buses are. So we go over to the mixer page and have a look at the agent tab. Here we see those buses, kick, snare, hi-hat, tom. They're all on tab number one, so that's buses one to four. On tab number two, we've got uh, two toms, a crash, and a ride. And in fact, that's it. There are eight uh, buses for this particular preset. From bus nine onwards, we have empty and unassigned buses. They're not doing anything. How do we get that pad to that bus? That's really easy. If we right click on the pad, you'll see the assign output option. Now, for now, I want you to ignore these 32. That's all about communicating with Cubase. At the moment, we're talking internally routed data. And that's found up at the top of the menu in the agent um, sub menu. And there we have our 16 buses. Kick is, the, is a named bus, and it's bus number one, down to bus 16, which is unnamed. You can also see that we have four auxiliary sends. So these are just in exactly the same way that Cubase is capable of, um, you can create a, a track in Cubase that, that becomes um, a, an FX track. You've got exactly the same concept inside Groove Agent. And in fact, some of our auxiliary sends in this preset have been assigned stuff. We've got a couple of reverbs on auxiliaries one and two. But those are your outputs your 16 standard agent outs, and then your four auxiliary sends. So across the 16 sounds of this drum preset, we have those eight buses. Each bus inside Groove Agent is a pretty rich sound environment in its own right. We have four insert slots, and you can see on the kick bus, we've got a uh, tape saturation, studio EQ, uh, vintage compressor, and then we've got our forced um, auxiliary send options down here, labeled S1 to S4 with the Genius Dark Gray scheme. And you can see that the snare is actually outputting to uh, auxiliary send number two. If we play the snare and then crank this right up, there's the big weighty reverb. In fact, the snare is fully loaded. We've got a tape saturation, studio EQ, an envelope shaper and then the vintage compressor at the end. So there's a hell of a lot of sound um, design 
going into each of these buses. This is a lot of time that the, the, the designers of this preset have gone to configuring all of this stuff. And so before you decide to arbitrarily send your pads directly into Cubase and ignore all of the internal routing options in GrooveAgent, just bear in mind that you're throwing away a lot of this stuff if you do. In addition to the inserts and sends options for each bus, we've got pan, something that I don't think I've ever explicitly mentioned in GrooveAgent, any control, if you hold the control key down on your keyboard and click a control, it resets it back to the central or default position. So I just reset that, that pan marker to, to central. Got a mute and solo here, and here's our master slider. And at the top left of each bus, we have uh, the output destination. Now, the reason why everything is currently in the box and Groove Agent is dealing with all of this stuff itself is because each of these buses route to the kit mix. The kit mix is on the kits tab. So basically this slot here, this bus, is where every one of those eight mix buses is being routed. All of the information is coming in here. I get this pattern going again. This is where every single sound goes to. The reason why you only see one slot is because there's only ever one kit bus per agent. If I loaded a second agent, then the second bus is immediately activated. These two things are always tied together and you can't do anything about it. There's always one of these for one of these. If I throw this away, then the bus is removed. So if you only have ever have one agent um, in use in Groove Agent, which is my preferred method, method of operation, I don't like using multiple kits because it confuses me too much. The kits page is actually redundant. It's not doing anything because from there, the outputs are then fed onto the master page. So this master bus here is the end of the line. This is the stereo out that's going to Cubase. We don't have any routing options on this bus because it can only ever go to the outside world. It, there's, there's nowhere else in Groove Agent that this data can be routed to. If we head back over to the Agent tab and just settle down here for a while. Let's talk about our various options uh, for getting our sound to Cubase. As we've seen at the moment, we've got this multi-layered mixing hierarchy where the pad goes to the agent bus, the agent bus goes to the kit bus, the kit bus goes to the master bus, the master bus goes out. We can circumvent the agent and kits options by right clicking on our output options. And instead of going into the agent menu, you can send it directly out. So let's do that instead and see what happens to Cubase when we route these pads directly to the outside world. We start off with the kick. Now, I never do anything with output number one. I leave it alone. One of the reasons is that this is how Cubase takes the track name. So if I send kick to output number one, it's actually going to call my Groove Agent instance kick. And I don't want that. I just want it. I want to be able to name the Groove Agent instance whatever I want. If I send to Cubase automatically created the lane for me. This is the beauty of using Groove Agent inside Cubase. The integration is really tight. And so now we've got a kick mixer channel. And in fact, we can do that with every pad. Here we have the cross stick. This is currently assigned to the snare bus. I can send that to output. There's your cross stick. And I'll do one more. I'll send this to output four. And there's our snare. So you can theoretically do that with every one of these pads. Now you've got 32 outs and 128 pads. So at some point you're going to run out. You're going to you're going to run out of outputs. You've only got 32 to play with. And that's why I personally recommend that you don't use this method of sending the pads directly from Groove Agent to the outside world. And I'll hold my hands up. Until very recently, this is what I did. I have no excuse or reason why I didn't use the internal preset buses. I think it was just a mistake on my part to do so, and I, I am now committed 
to permanently using these internal buses. So I'm going to throw this little bit of routing away and we'll start from scratch. Now the easiest way to throw output routing away is to actually select all outputs ironically and if you do there's no visible evidence of the fact that if we click this again it will actually deactivate all outputs. You get a confirmation box, are you sure? Yes. And now we've thrown all of that stuff away. It's actually pretty difficult to reset these outputs if you don't know that little trick. So that's the way to throw all of your existing output routing away. I'm going to revert this preset back to a completely unsullied state. So we've got all of our standard routing that was pre-configured in the preset. And now what I'm going to do is instead of sending the pad directly into Cubase, I'm going to send the bus into Cubase. So now any kick sounds that we have, I mean, kick's not a good example because there's only one of them. But if we have a look at the snares, you know, there are four different pads assigned to different snare sounds, but they all go to the snare bus. So they're all doing a common job. It's the same instruments that you're talking about. And so you want to treat them together for, for your mixing purposes. If this is, if that's not true and you want to split your cross stick out onto a different bus, that's absolutely fine. I'm only talking about this as a default. So from this point onwards, we're now going to select each one of these um, outputs that, that are all currently set to kit mix, the internal routing, and we're going to make it external routing instead. We ignore master. And so we start out at output two. And here is Cubase creating the kick track for us. So I'm now quickly going to run through the other seven, assigning all of those. Really didn't take long. Now I've got my entire kit. If I set this pattern running again, <clears throat> I've now got complete mixer control inside Cubase of that sound. It took me less than 30 seconds. The job's not quite done yet though, because we've got to we've got to decide what to do with our auxiliary sends. We've got four auxiliary buses, each of which have effects on them. And so we want to send those, well, potentially we want to send those to Cubase as well. That's absolutely no problem. You can see at the moment, they're all routed to the master. It's one of the, another one of the reasons why I avoid using the master strip um, as a mixing source is because so much stuff is routed to it by default that it's really easy to lose track of what's actually there. But if I split these up, so we go 10, 11, So now I've routed my four auxiliary sends to outputs and there they are. And at this point, nothing is actually going to the internal kit mix anymore. If I turn the pattern on, this is now completely silent. There is no sound getting there because every single one of the sounds of the buses, the eight instrument buses and four auxiliary buses are now being routed to Cubase. So now we've got the best of all worlds. We've retained every single facet of the original presets sound. All of the good stuff that the sound designers of this preset gave us, none of it's been thrown away. If we subsequently decide to throw some of that stuff away and say, no, I don't want you to do compression. I'll take care of the compression. That's absolutely fine. But what I'm saying is start out from the perspective of, OK, let's explode the sound out so that we've got absolutely everything. We haven't thrown a single thing away. But we've now got com complete control of the, of the sound of the preset inside our mix console. If you're wondering why you can see them in the mix co console and not in the track list, there's a little arrow button. We take that down. It's the show hide automation um, option, and that reveals all of the outputs for the instrument. And there they all are. And so now we can treat every one of those as if it was a completely independent instrument in its own right. And we've got total control over it. So that's my favoured method for working with beat agent kits. 
in the next video we'll um, have a look at acoustic and percussion agent kits they have quite a substantially different interface and a dramatically different way of interacting with cubase and we'll see all of that in the next video if you uh, hit subscribe and notifications you'll be sure not to miss it hope to see you then thanks a lot